Ora. Welcome everybody to this um, timely seminar from Dr. Kate Prickett, who is a New Zealander who did her entire academic training in the United States and spent 18 years there at um, UT Austin and University of Chicago and some think tanks before deciding she'd like to come back to our beautiful and beloved country. Um, but along the way, she did some work on American firearms ownership. And I'll hand it over to you to explain that, Kate. Yeah, great. Thank you, Hera. Um, thank you so much for having me today, Tenakwe, uh, Tenakoto. Uh, so I'm uh, in my new position, I'm the director of the Roy McKenzie Center for the Study of Families and Children, which is housed in the School of Government at Victoria University. And the goal behind uh, the center is to produce data-driven research that will inform New Zealand's families and children. Uh, this work that I'm presenting today is with a sort of a, I have a, a body of work that looks at uh, child health and well-being. And so in the American context, this means also firearms um, because this is one of the leading causes of death among children in the US. Uh, and so today I'm kind of, instead of just doing one study really well, I'm gonna try and mix three together and do it somewhat mediocre in a mediocre fashion. So I'm sorry if this gets a little scrambled. Uh, so what I'll do first is just set the context for you. So what does child mortality look like in the US in terms of firearm related injuries? Who are these families that have firearms? What do they look like? Uh, then uh, have a deeper dive into a study that came out in January, which looked at child mortality and changes in the types of firearms in the homes of American families. Uh, and then look at some of the policies that we try to enact typically on the state level in the US uh, and how this is influences safety behaviors in people's homes. And then try and talk about how any of this research may have some lessons for the New Zealand context and what we're experiencing right now. Right, so in the US, uh, approximately 1,300 deaths happen due to firearm-related injuries among zero to 17-year-olds, uh, and there's estimated to be around 5,800 non-fatal injuries per year. Uh, around 33% of uh, homes in America have a firearm in them. Uh, the study here that I'm, I'm citing doesn't find a difference between those that have children and don't, so around 33% of households generally. Uh, and it's estimated that around four and a half million children, so about 7% of all US children, are living in a home where there's a gun that is loaded and that is unlocked, so not stored in a cabinet or, um, or somewhere where they can't access it. Uh, and that chart that I'm showing you is from a very recent study um, in New England Journal of Medicine, which shows the top 10 causes of death between for one to 19 year olds. And what you're seeing there is a proportion of all deaths within a certain category. So the, the number one killer is car crashes. So around 20% of children, uh, of, of child deaths are due to motor vehicle accidents. 15% are due to firearms, right? And so that's more than cancer, which is around 9% of all deaths. So this is not just being alarmist. This is a real public health emergency, right? And it's one that's been going on for a while. Given that this is a public health emergency, you would think there would be a lot of research on this. Uh, that is not the case. Uh, I'm showing you a screen grab here from a recent article uh, in the New York Times where they commissioned some research here to show how much money is spent on different types of uh, diseases, I guess, or public health areas. Uh, and so you've got, along the bottom, you've got the death rate, right? So proportion of number of deaths per 100,000 people. And then going, and then you've got the types of um, death that is being examined by the research. And you see that there's generally a positive trend, right? So right at the top, you've got cancer, and you see that there's a lot of money spent on that. Um, that's on your, your y-axis. Down the bottom, in, in bolded, you see gun violence, right? So if we were expecting there to be um, a proportionate amount of research in that area, you would see gun violence dot sort of along that line. So what we're showing you here is that for the amount of people that are affected by gun violence, there is much less research going on. Uh, part of this is due to the Dickey Amendment, which was implemented in 1996, which uh, basically halted a lot of the research because it effectively ended the Center for D Disease Controls. That's our main research unit that looks at public health issues. Um, it stopped them from studying gun violence as a public health emergency. Um, technically, people call this a firearm research ban. Technically, it's not a ban, but what the amendment said is that you couldn't use this research to advocate for gun control. 
So, for example, I'm going to present work today that says that handguns are pretty bad for kids, um, and one of our recommendations is perhaps don't have a handgun in the home, right? That would be advocating for some type of gun control. So even though it didn't technically ban the research, it had a spooking effect, right? And so we haven't seen a lot of research. And why I wanted to bring that up is because I'm going to present some work that seems pretty rudimentary. What do these families look like? And the truth is we just don't know those things because it has not been the research. So some very basic things are not understood. All right, so the first study here um, was just looking at who are these families that own firearms and what are their safety behaviors. Uh, this was um, published in Maternal and Child Health Journal. My co-authors on this are Alexa Martin Story and Rob Krosner. Uh, and what we wanted to do with this paper was sort of have like a, uh, an ecological perspective on firearms, right? So the same things that may be uh, predicting whether you own a firearm could be very different to how you're storing that in your home, right? So we wanted to look at, is this a structural thing? Is it something about income or about having, or having you know, a father in the home? Or is it something about maybe disorganization within the family that may be contributing to the behaviors that we're seeing in these families? So the data that we use for this is the Early Childhood Longitudinal Study Birth Cohort. Um, this is a nationally representative birth cohort of children born in the US in 2001. So this is, this is old, right? This is old data, um, but it's the best data that we have. It's the last longitudinal study that we did with the birth cohort um, that's nationally representative in the US. And they didn't set out to study firearm ownership. So they were really interested in the context that children were being raised in. And they have a whole series of questions that asks about parenting behaviors that are associated with children's health. So um, you know, uh, whether you're wearing a helmet or you're using a car seat for your baby. Um, but in that battery of questions that they were asking about parenting behaviors, they asked them if they had a firearm in the home and how they stored that. Um, so we're using those questions to get a better look at what these families look like. Um, these questions were asked when the children were um, at the two-year and four-year wave. For the study, we're just using the four-year wave. We've got another study that looks at changes by, across those two waves. Um, we're not presenting that today uh, for time. So we, in the end, we have a sample of around 8,100 four-year-old children. There's sample weights to account for that attrition in the survey design. Uh, and it's all children in that four-year wave who are living with their mother at the time because she's the primary respondent. So the outcomes, so the questions that they ask, they ask, do you have a gun in the home? If you answer yes, then they follow up and say, do you keep all guns in a locked cabinet? Um, many ways to ask about firearms in the home. This is, this is an okay way to do that. It's what we're working with. Uh, and then we're interested in a wide range of covariates. And again, using that ecological perspective, we want to look at some more micro-level family processes. So is firearm ownership or safety behaviors associated with other type of parenting behaviors that are going on? Is it associated with maternal depression? And then we build out. So is it associated with being in a rural area or the region of the country that you live in? There's wide regional differences in the US and firearm behaviors. Uh, whether there's higher rates of mortality or ownership within your state. Uh, and then we also look at some of these sociodemographic predictors. We call them structural predictors. So the age of the parents, their race and ethnicity, uh, the educational attainment, family structure is a huge one, which you'll see, um, religiosity and, and income. So again, a very descriptive study, this one. And so all we do in the study is uh, some very simple logistic regressions. First, we want to predict who owns firearms within the total sample, and then just looking amongst those families that report that they have a firearm in the, um, in the home, uh, who's storing them correctly. Right, so what we find is we find around 78% report that they don't have a firearm in the home. Around 15% reported that they have a firearm, but it's locked in a cabinet. And around 7% own a firearm, um, but they do not keep it locked in a cabinet. Um, so that's around you know, 33% is that it? 33% of uh, the firearm owners don't lock them appropriately. So these are, I'm jumping straight to the results from the logistic regressions and I'm presenting odds ratios here and these are the significant uh, odds ratios that came through. Uh, one is sort of, is no effect. If it goes down, it means you decrease the likelihood that you own a gun. All right, so the first one is showing you race and ethnicity and all we're showing here is that white people own guns, right? So what you're showing here is that black people are you know, uh, much less likely to own a firearm, so Hispanic whites, and so are people from other races or ethnicity, right? So firearm ownership is, pre is predominantly a white phenomena. Uh, 
And then family structure matters too, right? So men in the homes own guns. It's not usually the mother. So all you're seeing here is that if you've got a man in the home, you're much less like, you're, you're more likely to have a firearm, right? If you're a single mother, you're not owning a firearm. So here we're looking at income, educational attainment, um, and what area you live in. And what we're showing here really is it's somewhat of a middle class phenomena, right? And, and not in the way that you all consider yourself middle class, like a, a true middle America here. So the income here is showing you that compared to the lowest quartiles, so those making less than 25K a year, you're more likely to own a firearm in those middle groups. Um, and same with education. So compared to those who are high school dropouts, um, you're more likely to own a firearm if you have a high school diploma, diploma or some uh, associate's degree or some university experience. But there's no difference between the high school dropouts and having a bachelor's degree or more. So again, sort of this middle class phenomenon of firearm ownership. And that final one shows you about what you would expect, that if you live in a rural area, you're much more likely to own a firearm. Um, but if you're in a suburban area, you're more likely to own a, own a firearm than if you're living in an urban area. Right? And so the, I just want us to state again that the odds ratios that I'm presenting to you are controlling for all these things plus other, other things too. Right, so now then we go ahead and we grab the sample who reported owning firearms and we looked at whether they had an unlocked firearm in the home. And here you'll see the story's a little bit different. Um, and it's sort of in line with what we hypothesize that maybe that safety behaviors are driven more so by these more micro level processes and these structural ideas around firearm ownership. Um, so we find that parents who report more parenting stress, that they're finding parenting stressful, they're much more likely to have an unlocked firearm in the home than a locked firearm in the home. Uh, that bike helmet use, that's the, the downward column is showing that if you report that you don't make your child wear a helmet, you're also more likely to report that you have an unlocked firearm in the home. And again, if you get, as you get wealthier, you're more likely to be locking your firearm in a cabinet. Right? So the processes that determine firearm ownership or that we sort of show are associated with firearm ownership, slightly different when you're looking at safety behaviors in particular. All right, so just to, to restate what we found here, 22% um, of families with young children were owning firearms, and about a third of them don't store them in a locked cabinet, a third of those families own firearms. Uh, when we're looking at firearm ownership generally, this is more likely predicted by these broader structural things and class things, so having a man in the home, um, being middle class, living in suburban areas or rural areas, being white. Uh, but when we're looking at Unlock firearms, this is predicted more so by those micro-level processes that are happening in the home. So more types of, so we we're calling family disorganization is correlated with not following through on these safety behaviors. All right, so that's setting the stage here for this um, second paper that came out um, a couple of months ago. And my colleagues on this are Carmen Gutierrez and Sudeep Dib. And here we were really interested in, so before we're showing you safety behaviors and firearm ownership, what does this mean anything for child health and mortality, right? So, so taking an, another step. And I was really motivated here by the stories that I screen grabbed and popped up here. If you Google toddler death and look at the news, these are, these are everywhere, right? So this is, these are accidental shootings by young children who are finding their parents' guns in their home loaded and unlocked. So as I said earlier, firearm-related deaths are the third leading cause of death of US children. So it's zero to 17 year olds, not, not toddlers, and I'll show you soon this. Um, we, this paper that I keep citing by Fowler has showed that child mortality due to firearm-related deaths actually has been declining quite significantly over the last few decades. Um, but recently what they were showing is that trend had actually stagnated. Right? And then for some groups, and in particular the group that I'm interested in, which is young children, this actually went up. Right, so that's what we're trying to examine here. So when you look just at one to five year olds, you see that their firearm related mortality rate doubled from 2006 through to 2016. Uh, and so what does that mean in real terms? That's just over a hundred children, uh, toddlers died due to firearm related injury. Uh, this is behind uh, drowning, which is the number one cause of injury related death. So 425, this is behind vehicle, motor vehicle crashes suffocation and fire burns and injuries is about par, right? So, so one of the leading injury-related causes of death among toddlers. Um, 
even though we have seen, I'm talking about the stagnation, this incline, we know about looking at firearm ownership rates that it has continued to decline over this time. So in essence, we sort of have this, this paradox, right? If deaths are tied to gun ownership, why are we not seeing these numbers still go down? So that's the question that we're trying to answer here. And we have two not necessarily competing explanations for this. Um, one might just be, and I'm, I'm a social demographer, so could it just be that there's shifts in sociodemographic composition of firearm owning families? So are the families that own firearms, are they just changing ways that perhaps they have more risky behaviors, right? So the stuff that I was just showing you earlier, maybe they're becoming people who own firearms are uh, more likely to experience parenting stress or do have other types of behaviors that are associated with child risk generally, right? So it could just be a shift in the composition of these families. Um, or it could be that maybe the types of firearms in the homes are changing in ways that make it more risky, especially for these young kids. Uh, so in this paper, we're looking at whether you have rifles in the home or whether you have handguns. Handguns pose a unique risk to young children. Um, if you have a handgun in America, the number one reason why you have one is for protection. So that means you're going to store it in a place that you can easily find it. Uh, and also so that's easily accessible, but also that it's loaded and ready to use, right? So if you're a child and you find this, it's much more deadly because it's loaded and ready to go. So how do we do this? Uh, we, use, uh, we use two different data sets that we put together here. So first we get our mortality data from the National Vital Statistics System, uh, and all these data are publicly available. So you can go and download all this data if you would like it. Uh, this information is from death certificates of all U.S. residents. Uh, and what we end up doing is we create these annual estimates of child mortality. Uh, and we do this separately for non-Hispanic white children and non-Hispanic black children. There wasn't good, um, good enough Hispanic data uh, prior to the mid-1980s, so we just looked at white and black children. Uh, and then to get the information on firearm ownership and how firearm types have changed over time, we use the general social survey. Uh, so this is similar to one that you have here in New Zealand, uh, but this one is, again, nationally representative of surveys of household attitudes and attributes. Uh, they do not ask firearm ownership every year. So sometimes it's annual, sometimes it's biennial, um, so we do some imputation to get around that. But what we do with this is we calculate an annual national average of firearm ownership among families that report having young children. And we do that for white families and black families. I'm only going to show you the results for white families today, and I can talk more about the black results um, later if you'd like to. So that ends up giving us an analytical data, a sample, of, a sample size of 41. Okay, So not a huge sample size here, so we can't do too much with these data. Um, and so this, again, will represent national level estimates for each year from 1976 through to 2016, which is the latest year we had available for the GSS uh, when we did the study. All right, so our outcome was young child mortality, again, estimating this separately for white, white and black children. And then the key variables that we're interested in was the firearm ownership rates and then the types of firearms in the home. Um, so again, these families are asked, do you have a firearm in the home? If you have a firearm in the home, you are then asked what type of gun this is. Is it a rifle, a shotgun, a revolver, a handgun? And so we use that to sort of have a, a distinction between long and short arms or handguns. Uh, so, so we have a proportion of families that have firearms in the home, and then we have the proportion based on what type of gun they have. And so this is three categories. We have one category that's, again, none, don't have a firearm in the home. Another that's just a rifle or shotgun, right? And another that has a handgun or a revolver. And they could have other, other guns in the home, but because our hypothesis is around that these small, these handguns matter more, we're just interested if you have a handgun in the home or not. Uh, and then we have some sociodemographic characteristics in the GSS data that we use here. Uh, we control for unemployment rate over time, because maybe it's something we know that the unemployment rate or poverty rate is associated with higher mortality, so we've got a control in there for that. Um, but then we also look at the characteristics of the families who own firearms. Uh, so the proportion that are living in a rural area, the proportion of uh, parents who own firearms who have higher education, who live in the South, and then incomes in the bottom quartile. And again, we can't do everything we would like to do here, but these seem to be sort of the most sensible ones to put in given the sample size and, and what predicts child injury generally. All right, so first, um, like I said before, there's not been a lot of research done on this. So we really just wanted to make it, have a description. How has family firearm ownership changed over time 
all these family of young kids and the types of farms in their homes. So that's, that's new. Uh, then we wanted to see whether there was, in general, a, an association between family farm ownership and child mortality. Then throw in the sociodemographic characteristics. Is it about something about the families that is changing that's driving these findings? Uh, and then add in, well, is it about the type of gun that matters? Uh, and so what we do is we do these time series analyses, these vector autoregressive models, and they capture the temporal and lag effect of the variables, the lag of mortality, and then also the trend portion of the variables. So these are very rigorous uh, models, and really what we're capturing is a change, right? So if there's a change in mortality, is that picked up by an associated change in the firearm rate? So it's, it's not causal, it is an association, but it's a pretty strong model. All right, so this is your mortality rate for, for white children. We've broken this out by males and females just for description, but we do combine the sexes uh, for the rate that we look at. Uh, and what you'll see, you'll see what we've talked about, that decline over time down to, to the early 2000s, and then you see that uptick right, in the last decade. Uh, boys of the dotted lines above um, and girls of the dotted line below, that main trend line, which you would expect. Um, these boys have been conditioned for more risky behavior. Okay, and for black children, you'll notice that their mortality rates are much higher. Right? And they have something a little different here, which you'll see in the 1980s and early 1990s, that big spike um, in deaths. Right? And so that's from the crack cocaine epidemic and the associated violence with that. Uh, and I want to say again, we're looking at one to five-year-olds. Right? So this is pretty horrific that they were not excused from the violence that was going on here, still, um, still hurt by what was happening there. So this is the firearm ownership among white families over time from 1970s through to 2016. And what we're showing you here is a total sample based on whether they have a firearm and what type of firearm in the home. And so that big gray area down the bottom is a proportion of families who said they did not have a firearm in the home. And it trends in the way that we would expect. So in 1976, around 50% of um, these white families said that they didn't have a firearm in the home, just went down to around 45% by 2016. So a slight decline. Uh, the darker gray in the middle, those are the proportion of families who said they had a rifle or a shotgun only in the home. And then that top part are those who said they had a pistol or handgun in the home. And so the interesting trend here is that you'll see in the earlier periods, a much greater proportion of families who had firearms or owning rifles, that dynamic changed over time, right? So where you see that, by 2016, um, around three quarters of families who have a firearm in the home have a pistol or handgun. Right? So quite dramatic change in the types of firearms in these homes. Right, so these are the results from the uh, vector autoregressive models. And so, as I said, we just want to see, is there a general association between family firearm ownership and child mortality rate? And that's uh, model one where we don't have any other covariates in the model apart from the trend lines. And we, so we show that, yeah, there seems to be, there's a statistically significant association, right? Whereby uh, for every percent increase in the proportion of families who report owning a firearm, there's an associated half a percent increase in the child mortality rate among white young children. Right, so in the second model, we, we ask, well, is this just something, is it about firearm ownership itself? Or is it something about that these families who own firearms are changing in ways that maybe make ownership more risky. And when we include those sociodemographic and contextual covariates, it doesn't attenuate that relationship much, right? It's, it seems to be something about guns. Families have not changed in ways that make them really riskier in terms of their sociodemographic characteristics. So then our final step then is to say, well, is there something about the type of gun that matters above and beyond, say, firearm ownership? And that's exactly uh, what we find here. So if you see the darker green uh, row that says pistol handgun, we see that that is significantly associated with child mortality. It's not the rifle and the shotgun. So here we believe that it's handguns that are driving some of that recent increase that we see. And again, for every percent increase in, um, in pistol and handgun ownership, you see an associated 4.3% increase in the uh, child mortality, or half a, close to half a percent increase in the child mortality rate. Great, so over time, what we showed in line of other research is that firearm ownership has declined slightly over time, but the ways that people own guns has changed in ways that makes it more risky for young children, right? They're more likely to own handguns. And we find that this increase in handguns is linked or associated with an increase in these toddler deaths. 
Right, so a final, another study that we did was, well, perhaps we could have some laws that address this, right, that might make these families um, participate in more safe behaviours uh, in their homes. Uh, and so this again was with my colleagues, uh, Alexa Martin Story and uh, Robert Krosner, and this one was published in um, AJPH. And what we're looking at here is whether laws aimed at making parents have safe, safer firearm behaviours work. And by this, we look at child access prevention laws. Uh, these are state level laws, so each state has, may have one of these laws, they may not, they may have varying degrees of how um, strong these laws are, um, but so we exploit that variation and looking at these trends at the state level. And so these laws really legislate safe firearm storage and child access and make uh, adults criminally liable, right? So if somebody gets shot, if a child has access to your firearm and shoots someone in the home, you could suffer some uh, repercussion, uh, repercussions to that. Uh, so far, the work that had looked at this had had mixed findings of their effectiveness when examining mortality and morbidity. A lot of studies that look at laws rely on aggregate data um, because we don't have this data at the uh, individual level. And, and they don't really find an association at the macro level between these cap laws and child mortality. Um, and so what we try to ask with this is using that data that I showed you earlier. Well, sure, we could look at mortality, but do they just influence the safety behaviors that we see in the home? Because we have these lovely data that show individual level um, safety behaviors. So that's what we do here. So again, we're using the ECLSB birth cohort um, at the four-year-old wave, and we look at a categorical measure of firearm outcomes. So whether you don't have a firearm in the home, whether it's stored safely, or whether it's not stored safely. Right, so things that these cap laws are meant to be targeting. Uh, and so we look at the state level laws and we have two variables that we're looking at. First, is there a cap law or not? So it's a binary variable, yes, no. And then we have one called the gun law strength index. And so this is an index going from zero to six uh, created by the Brady Center to prevent gun violence. And these are scorecards for each state based on their general legislative climate, right? So something more generally, not just about cap laws specifically. Again, we have the range of covariates that you saw earlier, uh, and we run some multinomial logic regressions. Uh, again, this, uh, this wave was in 2004, so that's what we're looking at laws from there. Laws change a lot, actually. Um, and what you're seeing here is the US Legislative Firearm Index. The darker a state, the more, more strong those laws are. Right? So the usual suspects, so the, the black ones, the black states are those that have the strongest laws, so California, New York, Connecticut, Illinois, uh, and then the white states are the ones that don't have a lot of laws at all. So you're looking at, um, uh, you're looking at the West, so Montana, Wyoming, Texas is there. What is interesting about this, though, is that you would probably expect there not to be much variation, I guess, in having a cap law and your legislative strength. And that's not really what we find. So, for example, I was living in Texas for a long time. It has a score of one, so very lax laws, but it has a child access prevention law. So we get to sort of look at the variation in those laws in this paper. And what do we find? Uh, we find what everybody else finds. We don't find any association between cap laws and firearm ownership and safety behaviors. We don't find any association between legislative index and your ownership and safety behaviors. What we do find, however, is an interaction between that legislative index and those cap laws, right? So in states with cap laws with stronger legislative index, there's increased odds of families storing guns safely, right? So we seem to show that these cap laws operate in a way that we'd expect it to, but only if this is a general, le general legislative climate that might limit guns to responsible gun owners in the first place. Um, but we don't find any, again, difference between not owning a firearm or storing it safely, which is important in the US context where gun ownership is a right, right? You don't want these laws affecting people's general ability to have a firearm. So generally, sort of as a, a broader set of findings here, what are the implications of this research agenda? Um, those, like I said, those cap laws are only as good as the laws that determine who can own a gun, right? So the thing that you will see a lot um, when people are talking about what is needed, universal background checks are really important, not just for how cap laws work, but for a wide range of other laws too, right? So this is something that is advocated strongly for, limiting firearms to responsible firearm owners. Um, we show that families who aren't storing guns correctly may be disorganized in other ways that could be identifiable to pediatricians. Right? And so prior work research has showed that if parents are actually generally quite comfortable talking with a pediatrician and want to talk about gun safety with them. 
Um, and so we encourage pediatricians and health practitioners to do that. And then we also find that families nowadays uh, who own guns are more likely to own guns that pose a risk to their children. And so there are gun safety programs out there. The ones that seem to work uh, or have good, have good evidence that they work in randomized control trials are those that not only provide families maybe with a storage cabinet, but also the information that goes along with that. So it's both those things matter. Uh, and there's been a lot of talk about gun lock and fingerprint technology as potential safeguards. So making sure that handguns only operate for the owner who has the fingerprint that matches um, what the gun can detect. All right, so in terms of lessons for the New Zealand context, I found some of these numbers online with the, I think it's a gun policy atlas. Does that sound correct? Yes, okay. Uh, we're estimated to have around um, a quarter of a million licensed firearm owners in 2018. Um, but we have an estimated 1.2, 1.5 million firearms, so around five to six guns per person, which probably means there's a lot of people who, who own firearms that don't have a license or have a lapsed license. Uh, we have a 1.24 death rate per 100,000, so that equated to around 55 deaths in 2015. And actually, it's very similar to the US context. A majority of those are from suicide, right? So mental health is a huge issue in New Zealand. Um, guns make suicide attempts much more deadly. Um, and in terms of handguns specifically, uh, what's interesting in New Zealand is you are not, when you give a reason for owning a firearm, you're not allowed to say that you're getting one for protection. Um, yet we're still seeing a huge increase in the number of handguns that are in circulation here. So some lessons that can be taken from the US context, especially in terms of families with young children, storage safety is really important. Um, what's really great in New Zealand is that storage practices are defined, they're regulated, and the initial police check, when you have a license, the police come to your home and look at your, how you're storing your firearms, making sure that you're storing them in a cabinet with the ammunition separately, so that's, that's mandated. Uh, but again, we don't have a gun registry, so when you purchase a gun, you, the police are not following up with you to see if you're storing that one correctly. Um, and so it may make these checks around storage incomplete. Uh, the types of guns have consequences, which we, we know too well here. Uh, so again, when you're owning a gun for protection is prohibited, a handgun's really necessary here, or necessary in the home, right? They could be stored at a, a gun um, at a shooting range. And something uh, personally that I've experienced when I've got here is, and I think is really important when we're having these broader policy discussions is to avoid this American tribalism language, I call it, right? So in New Zealand, firearm ownership is not a right. Uh, so when people start talking about it like it is, sort of borrowing some American language, at the same time, we need to not go the other way. Guns are necessary tools on farms, right? So people do need guns to go about their work. Um, so again, I just caution about getting into either side of that. It really it stops debate happening um, and making real change. Um, and so that is all I've got for you today. I'm going to leave you with this. This is when you know you've made it, is when the NRA comment to the press on your studies. Uh, and so this is the typical industry response to research on firearms. Thank you very much, Kate. Um, do we have any questions? Thank you for that. I was just wondering how you got around that law that prohibits um, the advocacy part of the work. So how did you get around mm. your recommendations mm. when you would publish or present this? Um, I'm not funded. <laughs> uh, the question was how you get around doing research when it's not, when it's um, prohibited by, well, gun, advocating for gun control is prohibited. So that's a ban on federal funding. Um, so there is, a lot of states are now funding their own research. There's a lot of private donors that are invested, a lot of nonprofits that are uh, spending more money on this. So research is being funded through that way. When I began this work, uh, my, my broader research agenda looks at inequalities in children's health and well-being. So firearms was necessary, but I started it as a, as a graduate student, <laughs> where you're a bit more flush with time. <laughs> and some of you would, yeah. But, so people are doing this work, has been, 
down, but hopefully the climate is changing in terms of other people stepping up to fund the work. So congratulations, it's a really nice piece of work um, and really good. Um, I, um, I guess my question is, how do we um, put, how do we put the, gun control is a political context, especially in America, but even here. How do we make the legislative changes that improve this? How do we advocate and move this on, move, um, I guess, gun control, but um, gun banning or would be, mm -hmm. <laughs> how do we, how do we say that the more handguns you have, the, m the more dangerous, the, m the more guns that are accessible to children, the more child deaths there would be? And how do we make that part of the political discourse? Well, I, I mean, we've had, had this terrible terrorist attack, right, that has really, has prompted change, right? It already has. And so I think that felt like an easy move. I think what we're going to see in the, in the following months where we really want to do some more comprehensive change that makes the, that promotes gun safety, that's going to be happening in the next few months. I think it takes a lot of participation from a lot of different actors, right? So it's, there are people who, people who are advocating for gun control, um, researchers like um, you all in the room and myself, making sure that we're putting the research front and center of people to show that there are consequences to an unchecked and unregulated um, gun environment. So I don't know if that satisfactorily answers your question, but I think it involves us being diligent and talking and using the knowledge that we're generating here to provide that information and show that it's important. I think it was a related question, really. I was, I was just wondering how, you know, the, those statistics of the number of children killed by guns in relation to cancer and things, you know, they're, they're astonishing and frightening and horrible. Mm. But, um, you know, a lot of the advocacy does go around school shootings and things like mm. that, which, of course, are an enormous issue. But, you know, the response is, oh, we need to arm teachers and all this mm. sort of thing. And, you, you, and I don't agree with that at all. But you can almost, you can see how you can argue that. But, but you can't argue against the fact children being killed in the home by unlocked guns and you know that's just no one could possibly say there's any solution to that other than better storage and gun control and mm -hmm. things. I'm just wondering how is, is that being used or are we if we're advocating around massacres and, and schools and, mm -hmm. and those sorts of things is, is that in some way are we not doing enough around the other side of it the, the more prosaic things of, of children being shot in homes or finding guns and, and how does the NRA and people like that respond because I, I just can't see any answer to that you know, that that's got to be wrong. That's, that's got to be something we should do something about. Yeah, I, I, when we began this work, we, it was, we always felt by focusing on young children, we could somewhat get around the argument that it's guns that are killing people and not people with guns because most people, I, don't, I have a four-year-old, so sometimes they're psychopaths, but like most of the time, children, are very innocent children should not be getting killed by firearms. Um, and so you're right that there is an increased focus on school shootings when you can easily see from the data that it's more toddlers are dying than maybe children in schools. Uh, from the research point of view, uh, something that has been pushed over the last few decades, well, not from a research point of view, something that's been pushed over the last few decades, in particular by the NRA, is the idea that you are safer in your home if you have a firearm, right? And so because you're protecting your family. So not having a gun is actually not. So again, that's why I want to sympathize with these families that experience these things because they've been told that they're doing the right thing by their family by protecting them uh, when the research clearly shows the opposite. Um, but again, that research hasn't been out there. It's just being done now. So it's getting that message across. Um, yes. That's Good luck. <laughs> Do you have any observations about what makes people change their attitude or their um, behavior with, with guns and, and young people? Uh, we have a study that looks at changes. Uh, and we show in that study, when you look at across the two and four year wave, you show that people's behaviors generally, in terms of firearm safety, get better as children get older. Um, because they think that as they get older, then they may be more likely to find the gun, they may be able to use it. Even though we sh research shows that two-year-olds are able to have a tensile strength to operate a handgun, generally 
behavior changes in ways that make it safer. Um, we do find correlates of that behavior that stops change. And again, it goes back to this family or disorganization. So we show that in parents who are drinking more are less likely to also follow through and change their behavior in ways that make it safer. Um, I think generally there's a lot more talk or a lot more public support for common sense laws, which may help change safety behaviors within people's homes. But again, we don't have that data. Uh, we don't collect that data. We don't know if that's what's happening. Oh, like what would be more important? Oh, I mean, the, the research that has been done using macro level data is very clear that if you have in states that have a proper background check system, those law, other laws that are targeted at say domestic violence offenders or families, those work. Right, so we know, we do know in, in some aspects what works and some of that is regulation and having a universal federal level background check system that works would be one of those things that would change behavior or at least limit firearms to people who are responsible with them. I can repeat your question to the to microphone too. What are the death rates in countries that have banned handguns? I mean, the, I don't know exactly what the numbers are. They're, they're available, but the, the death rate by firearms is much lower <laughs> in those countries that ban handguns. Um. Yes, a great presentation. Really fantastic what you'd be able to extract from that data using those very sophisticated methods. I already had a similar question, Nebels, about what are, the, what are the numbers like in New Zealand of um, child deaths from firearms in the home? And also, uh -huh. do you plan to extend your research um, into New Zealand using New Zealand data? Yeah, I, I probably would like to. Uh, Marie, were you just saying that you have looked how, how many child deaths there were this last year? No, you'd hear? Sorry. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to punt it. Yeah. <laughs> we don't really even have that much data here. Um, Lucy's been doing some data using what we've got, and maybe we could hand over to Lucy to say <laughs> talk about what she's managed to find. Yeah. Sorry, I've just been looking at this this morning, <laughs> um, and I haven't got to the deaths yet. I've just been looking at hospitalizations. Um, currently, in the under 15 year olds, there are less than, on, on average, less than 10 hospitalizations per year for, um, for gun injuries. Um, and that under the 15 under 15 year age group makes up currently about 11% of hospitalizations for gun injuries. Um, I'll tell you this afternoon what, <laughs> what the deaths say. And can we do that as a per capita? We could, yes. I mean, this was, I was just looking at the total numbers at this stage. I haven't done the rates yet. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> um, do we have more questions? Um, um, thanks for a great presentation. That was um, fascinating. Um, I guess I had two questions. One was about the gender aspects of it. Mm. Um, I wondered if you could talk a bit more about that, about the fact that it's men who are owning guns and white men that are owning guns mm. in the States. I was really surprised to see the, the ethnic differences. Um, and my second question, I've now forgotten. Oh, yes, no, that's where it was. Did we, did we ask about gun ownership in um, the Growing Up study? Oh. I haven't seen it in the growing up study. No, I, I'll double check, but I don't recall seeing it. And I've been working with those data quite heavily in the last few months. Um, you know, yep, yeah, no, the gender aspect is, is huge, right? So men own guns, um, and which we sort of, in our study, we found a, a lower, I guess, firearm ownership rate. And we think part of that is the fact that also the primary respondent was a mother, and she doesn't always know if there's like a firearm in the home either. Right. Um, um, particularly if she's not married or, you know, this may be a boyfriend or something. You may not know if there's a firearm in your home. Um, so it's definitely a, a male phenomena. We have an, another study that is looking at, you know, what do these firearms in the home mean for women who are in high conflict relationships? Again, as a tool of abuse, almost. Um, you know, we find that in, you know, being in a high conflict relationship is associated with higher rates of maternal depression. When you throw a gun in there too, that's even more elevated, right? Because that can be used as a, as a tool of control. Um, so, yeah, it's definitely a gendered phenomena. 
Okay, I think that brings us to quarter past. Um, and I'd like to thank Kate for that very interesting um, presentation. And um, yeah, thank you for having me.